Okay, thank you for coming and welcome to the graveyard slot. <laughs> but, but you're here and I appreciate you being here and taking the time to listen. About 13 years ago, I was having some carpets fitted and uh, the carpet fitter came and he began to discuss what kind of carpet I wanted and uh, what kind of color. And, and during the conversation, it came out, he was a Salvationist. And he said, oh, by the way, I've got six records in my loft of William Booth preaching. Would you like to listen? I tried not to bite off his hand. I said, don't go to any trouble. But So he, he brought along, true to his word, six records of William Booth. But there was a problem. There were 78s. Now, some of you under the age of 25 haven't a clue what a 78 is. It's not someone who's passed their sell-by date. It's a record that goes around at 78 revs per minute. And so I need to go and buy a record player. So William Booth cost me 60-odd pound. So I went and bought a record player that could play 78. And sure enough, there was the general preaching. You can also go on to the, uh, to the website and just pick up little snippets of, of William Booth preaching. His voice is totally different from what I expected. It's very high. It's very squeaky but maybe that's due to the fact it's over 100 years old. During the past 12 months, I have immersed myself in the life of William Booth. Uh, I knew of him. Everyone knows about the Sari army, and especially at Christmas, the rattling of the tins and the blowing of the trumpets and all the rest. But I knew very little about William Booth, so I've immersed myself in the life of William Booth. Looking at the man and his wife and his legacy... And I say to you at the very beginning, at the end of it all, I find myself very perplexed. He's a bit of a conundrum of a character. And, and there are things about him that I want to hug and say, William, I wish I had just a bit of that in my own heart. And there are other bits of about him which I say, oh, dear me, William, how on earth did you allow that to happen? And then there's his wife. I'm, I'm scared to say anything after this morning. Was she a feminist? I don't know. And I found myself saying, would I have liked Catherine Booth as my mother? Getting a bit nearer. My sister? My wife? You form your own opinion. She was a very, very strong kind of person. Maybe that's because she stands out in a very masculine age. One thing is quite clear. She wore the trousers. She set the tone for the home. And so what I want you to do is to kind of be familiar with this man so that you then go and do your own research. By the way, at the end of his life, he said he'd preached 60,000 times. And he traveled 5 million miles. As I mentioned the other day, without an aeroplane in sight. Wow. Even if half of that is true, because he loved to exaggerate. Even if he'd only preached 30,000 sermons... <laughs> and traveled two and a half million miles, I still I think that is pretty impressive. He's such a character that since he died, 50 biographies, I mean well-meaning biographies, not some little pamphlets, but well-meaning biographies have been written on the life of William Booth. It shows you the kind of man that, that he really was. By the way, I've got no point to prove. I've got no ax to grind. I'm just here to tell you the life story of William Booth. He was born in Nottingham in 1829, just 30-odd years after the death of John Wesley. He was brought up in an Anglican home, whatever that means, uh, you know, C of E or C and E, Christmas and Easter. <laughs> and uh, his, his parents didn't really go to church, and by the time he was 12, his father had died. He'd left them in very difficult financial straits. And so at the age of 14, William Booth went to work to try and bring some money into the home, and he worked as a pawnbroker's assistant. Now, you've got to understand, this is the end of uh, the Battle of Waterloo, when there was great unemployment. Then we went through several bad harvests. Then the, the corn laws, which caused terrible trouble with people rising up against the government, especially in places like... Uh, like Manchester, where several people were arrested. And so while all this was going on, people were desperate for money. And, uh, and so pawnbrokers really came into their own, where people were just kind of trying to get just a little bit of cash to survive. And that's where he began to cut his teeth as a 14-year-old boy. He said later on in life, I felt ashamed that that was my occupation. And, and when he qualified, 
He was desperate to get out of it, but he couldn't get out of it because jobs were hard to find. As a teenager, he was taken along to a Methodist chapel in in Nottingham. If you go there today, it is now a cinema stroke cafe. Uh, And I've got a photograph from inside the cinema cafe where it says it was here that William Booth was converted. I'm absolutely amazed it's still there. But but he went along and uh, he heard a man preach one Sunday called Fergus O'Connor. No guesses from where he came from. Kuwait. No, he came, <laughs> he came from Ireland. And, and, and he preached, and, and young, young William Booth was, was quietly converted. He said he could take you to the pavement, to the very flagstone, where he yielded his life to Christ. And he said, if I could lift that stone, like the children of Israel lifted those 12 stones out of the Jordan, and if I could put that in my home, it would be a constant reminder of what God did for a young 17-year-old boy one evening. He found a soulmate as soon as he got converted in a man called William Sanson. And they both had a desire to evangelize. I mean, having never heard the gospel clearly until his mid-teens, he said, how come I've missed this? So William Sanson and William Booth both went out to the streets of Nottingham. They would, they would take a chair, stand on it, sing a hymn or a duet, gather a crowd around them, preach for a few minutes, and then move to the next street. And uh, they were loving it. They were cutting their teeth. He admitted later on in life it was a bit ropey around the edges, but we meant well. He was in a church that had a congregation of a thousand people. And that was an average Methodist church in, in Nottingham in those days. But he noticed when he started to do this with his friend William Sampson, everyone warned him against it. William, don't do this. Leave this to the minister. You're part of the laity. This is clergy job and he noticed in those days that there was very little evangelism done outside of the church it was all done inside the church and and these two young boys said wait a minute if it was left to that we probably would never have heard about the Lord Jesus Christ we've got to go out tragedy suddenly struck when his friend William Sanson died of, of consumption he was absolutely mortified thinking I can't believe it Not only have I lost a a good friend in life, but I've also lost a man who really cares about the gospel. As soon as he got converted, by the way, he became very legalistic. Uh, He refused to work on what he called the Sabbath. And he said to the owner of the pawnbroker shop, a man called William Eames, and by the way, I don't know how this has happened, but the very door from the pawnbroker shop is still around and... There's a photograph there on the board of it. So you can look at this door that William Booth went in and out of, and you'll get blessed. If you listen carefully, you can hear the band play as the door opens. It's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. He said, to his, he said to his manager, you know, I can't work. It's the Lord's Day, and I'll work right up till the last minute before midnight on a Saturday, and I'll work from the first minute after midnight on Monday morning, but I will not work on the Lord's Day. He was fired on the spot. After a fortnight, Mr. Eames realized he'd sacked his most reliable worker and ate humble pie, knocked on his door and said, I'm really sorry, would you come back to your old job? And so he completed his job as as, uh, a pawnbroker's assistant. He drank deeply from the waters of Methodism. I love this quotation. I thought that there was one God and John Wesley was his prophet and that the Methodist people were his special people. He then began to start preaching on the inside. They began to realize this man has a little bit of a gift, so so let's encourage him, let's put him on the circuit. So he began to go around the Methodist circuit, preaching to smaller congregations, and he noticed there wasn't really much joy. He uh, he commented on, on one occasion that everyone was singing, Oh, happy day, oh, happy day. And he said, I looked around, and there wasn't much happiness to make it a happy day. And... Uh, He said of these people, they are respectable, but dull. And he said, religion was never made to make us dull. As he went around preaching on his own, because he couldn't find another soulmate after William had died, he began to gather around a group of people. I suppose we would call them the untouchables. You know, people really, what do you do with them? 
He gathered them around and said, why don't you come with me one Sunday evening to, to chapel, to Broad Street Methodist Chapel. So he brought them in through the front door. And he was a little bit cheeky. He put them in the best seats. He said, what are the best seats? For those who put silver in the collection. And they were sat there. You can imagine the odor was quite interesting. Uh, people suddenly felt moved to go towards the walls. <laughs> and uh, the church didn't know what to do with this crowd of, quote, unquote, unchurched people. When the service was over, the minister had a little chat with him, a man called Samuel Dunn, and said, William, don't you ever do that again. If you want to bring these people into church, you bring them in, number one, through the side door, and number two, you put them in the cheap seats where those who put silver in the collection cannot see them. <coughs> Suddenly, William Booth really realized that Methodism had come, become respectable. <coughs> Having qualified, he then went down to London to look for a new trade. He didn't want to be a pawnbroker, dealing with people who were sad and in a desperate situation. He, he felt terrible making a living out of these people. So he went to London to find a job. He couldn't find one. The only job he could find was working in a pawnbroker shop. And so reluctantly, he took on that role again. There was accommodation above the shop where he, he, he was working, and so that's where he worked for a little while. He went along to the local Methodist church, got settled in, and then started to do what he was doing in Nottingham, taking a chair, going out into the street, singing a couple of songs, standing on the chair, and preaching. When it came to renewing his class ticket... Because in Methodism in those days, you could not break bread until you had a class ticket, which, which proved that you'd been so many times along to the service. When it came to renew his class ticket, the minister said, William, I can't renew it because you're never here. He said, well, I'm never here because I'm out preaching. Yeah, but you should be here, and we don't like this preaching out in the streets. So he said, well, if that's Wesleyan Methodism, I'm leaving and so he left them and then joined the reformed Wesleyan Methodists. <laughs> he, he was preaching around the circuits there, and there was one man in one congregation who heard him preach, a man called Mr. Edward Rabbits. And, and as William stood on the door at the end of the service, Mr. Rabbits said, y young man, what is your job? He said, sir, I'm ashamed to tell you I am a pawnbroker. He said, that is no calling for you. You are a preacher. And I am willing to pay you 20 shillings a week for three months to get you established as an evangelist. Are you up for it? He was. He went back on Monday morning to his boss and said, uh, I'm leaving. The man got very angry. Is it overpay? No, it's not overpay, he said. It's, it's the calling that I want to do. And so he finished his time as a pawnbroker and he went out as an evangelist. As he was sort of uh, preaching around and so on. On his 23rd birthday, he went to a meeting in Cowper Street, and who was there but a young lady called Catherine Mumford. He looked up, and he was smitten. Now, she was a strong-willed woman, and uh, she certainly let her opinions be known. Now, George Bernard Shaw had no right to say this. I'm just quoting him. Quote, <laughs> Catherine Booth was the least photogenic woman in London. End of quote. What a thing to say. Well, he was no oil painting either, was he? But anyway. While, while she was a very plain lady, I suppose, she was very bright. And she had a lot going on between her, her, her ears. Her parents didn't want her to go to school in case she got involved with the world. She wasn't allowed to read secular literature. All she could read was uh, Christian literature uh, and read the Bible. Somebody gave her Pilgrim's Progress. She read it, took an instant dislike to it. She said, this is riddled with Calvinism. <coughs> now, I've read Pilgrim's Progress many times, and I struggled to find too much Calvinism in Pilgrim's Progress. But there we are. That was, uh, that was her. By the way, William Booth had no time for Calvinism. And I think when they got married, they certainly did not have tulips at the wedding. <laughs> when, when, when William announced his engagement to Catherine Munford, Mr. Rabbits said, oh, I don't like her. So the 20 shillings a week stopped. So he suddenly found himself in love, but penniless. <laughs> 
wondering, what on earth do I do? Fortunately, a Wesleyan Reformed, uh, Reformed Wesleyan church down in Spalding had heard of the preaching of this young man, and they offered him a call. Would you come and join us and do some preaching? So he went down to Spalding for 18 months. He said on his first Sunday, 14 people were converted, and uh, he was there for around 18 months, going around that part of the country, just preaching the gospel in, in those kind of churches. While they were there, Catherine was back in London. They used to write to each other, and we have copies of their letters you would never believe they were in love. She used to write to him and say, in the last letter, you made so many spelling mistakes. Get it right next time. <laughs> By the way, don't eat too much meat and never eat mustard. And so William Booth, at the end of his life, finished up neither eating flesh nor fowl nor fish. I mean, he finished up living upon rice pudding. You would almost call him a kind of vegetarian. It reminds me of the story of two spinster sisters who were, who, who were health fanatics and never ate anything fatty. They lived on muesli. And they ate muesli upon muesli upon muesli. Anyway, both eventually died in their 90s and they met in heaven. And one said to the, isn't this a wonderful place? Said the sister, it's beyond comprehension. And you know, if we hadn't eaten so much muesli, we'd have come here 20 years earlier. <laughs> just, just a couple of months before they got married, the minister in the church in London where Catherine was, was a member made some off-the-cuff comment about women. She thought it was very derogatory and putting women down. And so she wrote him a very long letter saying, I think you're totally wrong by what you said. I feel offended by your comments, and here's my opinion. She then sent a copy of the letter to William to see what he thought. William was more in agreement with the minister than with his wife to his <laughs> letter. That caused great tension for a little while, but in the end, he, he kind of bit his tongue and he yielded to keep the whole situation together. Why? Because Catherine Mumford was never wrong. They were married on the 16th of June, 1855, and only two people came to the wedding. His mother didn't come. Remember, his mother now is, is, is a widow. She's living on her own in Nottingham. No, she doesn't come to the wedding. Just his father-in-law, Catherine's father, and Catherine's sister. You say, what about the mother-in-law? She didn't like him. And she said to Catherine, I do not like the man that you're marrying. He's ill-educated. He has no income. And that is not good for you. And so she refused to go to the wedding. And it was only some years later that, that William Booth actually said to his mother, oh, by the way, this is my wife. What a kind of interesting life they lived in those days. Having got married, Catherine said to William, I think that your days in the Reformed Wesleyan Methodist are over. Let's find a new denomination. They thought about the Congregationalists and then they remembered the two Calvinistic. And so they joined the New Connection, which is another branch of Methodism. And the reason why they joined there is because Catherine wanted her husband to be ordained to have some credibility. And so having joined the New Connection, he then went along to their college to train for ministry. And he was up very early in the morning trying to get his head around Greek and Latin. Now, it's ridiculous. You know, he wasn't cut out for that. He wasn't a scholar. And he struggled big time, and it was only sheer, sheer willpower and effort that actually got him through any form of exams. And, uh, but he was different. And when he preached his kind of college sermon, you had to preach your college sermon, not only to your, your, your kind of lecturers and your fellow students, but in front of a natural congregation. He says that when he preached on that day, 22 people got converted. Now, whether that's true or not, or whether that's a Buddhism, I really don't know. He was kind of flamboyant. The kind of man who, who when he was preaching, you know, totally different from, from what was going on in this. He'd be waving his hanky around and standing on the chair and jumping up and down. And you can imagine for your young person in the Victorian, you're thinking, 
this is interesting. (laughs) Certainly a lot different from our minister. Having qualified, he was offered the post, it shows you how desperate they were, of the superintendent of a circuit in the New Connection. He turned it down. He said, I'm not up to this. And so he said, I will take the post of being a deputy superintendent, which gives me a chance to go around the country preaching. So he was part of a circuit, but uh, for 30 months he traveled everywhere around the United Kingdom preaching the gospel. He kind of came in, you can imagine, <coughs> stared up the town, stared up the churches, and then rode on to his next kind of uh, to, to his next uh, appointment. The sheep loved him. The shepherds didn't. It was after he's gone, what do we now do to calm the congregations down and to bring them back to a little uh, more reality? After 30 months of this and many complaints from circuit ministers all around the country, the Connection Conference said to him, William, we're going to give you a church. And so they sent him to Brighouse in Yorkshire. No, don't shout. (laughs) They sent him to Brighouse, and uh, the idea was, let's shackle him in a church. That will sort him out. So, for credit to the pair of them, with all good grace, they went to Brighouse. They settled down. They nuttled down to pastoral work. But they both admitted, this is not for us. And so he said to the connection committee, you know, I, I appreciate this, but this is really not me. Okay, they said, we'll give you a bigger church. So they sent him to Gateshead, which had a membership of a thousand people. And so he went there with his wife and and with his growing family. By the time they were in Gateshead, by the way, they now had four children. They finished up with eight, by the way. So there he is. He's in Gateshead with this new church. Most of us, I think, would be happy with a congregation of a thousand people. Seeing the church slowly grow, seeing people come to faith in Christ, but, but not William Booth. Where he was placed was was very depressed. He tells us later on that there was one outside toilet to every eight houses. Okay, you think in those days maybe ten people per household? So one toilet to 80 people. Wow. He saw that. He saw great poverty. He he saw, uh, I mean... Terrific infant mortality. He said one in three children born within the vicinity of the church died. Seeing such poverty, seeing such unemployment, uh, and seeing such poor sanitation deeply affected him. And he said to his wife, it's all right me preaching to a thousand people, but who's going to tell all these people about the Lord Jesus? And it would be true to say, I don't like to say too strong a word, But I would say he probably had a a mini nervous breakdown. Whatever that means, it just overcame him uh, and it kind of crushed him. He had to disappear down to to Derbyshire for nine weeks. He was a great believer in hydrotherapy. You know, taking the waters at Buxton Spa. Uh, Who paid for him there? I have no idea. But but that's where he often went. While he was there, one Whitsun Sunday morning in 1860... Just as he'd finished preaching, was about to announce the final hymn, his wife Catherine came up to the pulpit and said to her husband, you can imagine the whole congregation watches the minister's wife walk up, walk up to the pulpit. She whispers in his ear, I'd like to share something. Okay. So she said to the congregation, I have felt for a long time God has been calling me to be a preacher. You'd have thought a little bit of discussion with the husband at home would have helped. <laughs> he was stunned. So was the congregation. Whether he panicked or or whether she kicked his ankles, he said, my wife will be preaching tonight at half past six. And she did so. And that was the beginning of Catherine Booth becoming a preacher. It was said she was a far better preacher than, than William. And for the next 28 years, until the Lord took her home, she was a preacher. Every year, the new connection, like Church of England, like the Methodist Conference, like the Congregational Church, have their annual convention. When that year came in Liverpool, 1861, the month of May, he went down as a New Connection minister. He was on the agenda. Why is that? Because he said, I want to go back on the road. I don't want to keep preaching in one place. 
So I want you to commission me to go on the road as a full-time evangelist for the New Connection. Some folks said, yes. Some people said, no. Others said, no. Give him a smaller pastorate, but give him more freedom to go on the road. He said, no, it's either yes or no. He could see the way the vote was going. It was going to go against him. And so he and Catherine resigned from the New Connection Methodist Church and were now denominationalists. Fortunately for him, a friend of his who would come to Christ under his preaching was now pastoring at a place called Hale in Cornwall. He said to William, I heard that you've left the pastorate. Why don't you come down to Cornwall? And so William Booth traveled down to Cornwall, and he was there for 18 months. He tells us in his writings that while he was there, he believed that 7,000 people came to Christ. Again, is that a Boothism? Well, if it is, I will settle at 3,500 myself, give or take one or two, but it's an awful lot of people. But not everyone was happy. Don't forget, Cornwall is Methodist country. Not too long prior to this, John Wesley was down there, so was the primitive Methodists, so were the Bible Christians. When he arrived, all the Wesleyan Methodist churches and all the primitive Methodist churches had separate conventions to discuss William Booth. What do we do with this man who's come here, who's just left the new connection? And both conferences of the primitive Methodists and, uh, and of the Wesleyan Methodists said, you must not allow this man to hold a meeting in your chapels. So you can see already, opinion in Methodism was, uh, was greatly divided. While he was doing that, his wife was going back and forth to, to London where she was living. You know, she's, she's trying to look after children. And uh, by the way, it's interesting, in those days, the Booths, not only had Mr. and Mrs. Booth and, and, and their children who were growing, they also had two servants, which is quite interesting, and also a children's nurse. And in one of her letters to her mother, which we still have got, she writes to her mother, things are bad this week. We have gone a whole week without a servant. I can feel the stress. <laughs> when his mission in... Cornwall came to an end. He was now a gypsy. He went to Cardiff for a while. And in Cardiff, you can remember when I, I spoke about uh, church history in, in previous talks, I spoke about the Corey brothers in Cardiff who were great supporters of, of the movement. Uh, I say the movement, which is, is which the outreach of the Presbyterian church to build mission halls to people who wouldn't come to church. And Bethlehem Sandfields, where Dr. Lloyd-Jones went to, that was one of those movement mission halls, as was the Heath Church in Cardiff, which is one of the most splendid mission halls I've ever seen in my life. But uh, the Corys were big financial bikers. When they heard William Booth preach, they liked what they heard. Why? Well, because they were men who had supported people building mission halls. So they supported him and said, uh, we'll pay for you to go into tents to preach the gospel. In fact, because they were big ship owners... They said, we've got a brand new ship just coming sort of out of dry dock. We're going to name it the William Booth. And whatever profit the William Booth brings in, we will send to the Salvation Army. They launched it. It sank. <laughs> but being the kind of men they were, true to their word, they carried on supporting him personally, for 50 years. From Cardiff, he went up to Ripon. And he was in Ripon trying to run a church mission when his wife had a call to run a mission down in Rotherhide. She said to William, do you mind looking after the children while I run the mission? So here is William Booth in Ripon trying to run a mission, looking after, I think it's between five and six children. She's down in Rotherhide running a mission. He said, this is not workable. So he brought the mission to a close, took the family all the way down to London, and, and he settled there. Having settled down there, his wife then went on to a mission in Islington, which is the better end of London. And what is interesting is this. William Booth's wife, Catherine, reached out to the higher end of society. 
She reached out to well-to-do people, whereas William kind of reached out to people at the lower end of society. So both of them were evangelists, but, but reaching out to different kinds of people. But both of them acknowledged the church had failed people in the street. The thing about her is that she was incredibly vocal about it. I mean, on one occasion, she was at a well-to-do meeting. You can imagine this, the Victorian era, people well-dressed. The place was packed out, you know, lots of hats which looked like fruit bowls. You know, people singing their feathers weathering around. And they're singing, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. And she stopped at him and said, you have no desire to rescue the perishing or care for the dying, so why are you singing it? You can understand how she very quickly alienated people in the nonconformist church. One Methodist uh, businessman offered to build Catherine Booth a building the size of the Metropolitan Tabernacle just for her to preach in, believing that she would fill it and do a great work for London. Thankfully, she declined it. The population in London around this time was 3 million. Today, it's around 8.7 million, going up to 9 million. 100,000 people of those people were paupers. And it was said in those days, three consecutive days of wet weather would put 30,000 street vendors out of work. The economy in London was was very, very kind of fragile. And, uh, you know, it was not an easy place in which to live. At the same time, 370 sewers pumped into the Thames every day the waste of the capital. Therefore, during this time, you can imagine the Thames was a terrible river. It stank, and during summer, Parliament did not meet because they could not cope with the smell of of the River Thames. They were just short of 31,000 prostitutes working the streets of London, and the prisons of London were filled with 30,000 people. So this is the kind of city in which William Booth had come back to try and do a work. He decided he was going to go out to the east end of London to do something. His motto was this, go for souls and go for the worst. So he went to the east end. The trouble is he lived eight miles from there. So it was a 16-mile round trip to go where he wanted to do a work. And sometimes he was so shattered at the end of the day, he would just sleep in the hall in which he'd hired and maybe go home two days later, living on bread and cheese out of a brown paper bag. He was attacked on a regular basis there, and it was not uncommon to see William Booth with a huge kind of bandage round his head, uh, having been assaulted and, and, and attacked through preaching. And if you go to the East End of London now, you can still see the blind beggar, where all this started. You can still see a statue. In fact, there are four statues, two of William and two of Catherine Booth, to say, this is where William Booth had a heart to reach people who weren't being reached. He came home one day after being in the East End of London and he said to his wife, I have found my niche in life. These are the people I want to reach. And so William Booth started to work among the East End people of London. He started off working with a man called Thomas Bernardo. I think it's an apocryphal story which says they came to some agreement where Bernardo said, I'll go for the children, you go for the adults. But in reality, that is what happened. Bernardo went for for the children, and certainly William Booth went for the adults. For 11 years, and that's three words, for 11 years, that's a long time, he just worked day after day after day after day. And after 11 years, the work had so grown that he had 26 flourishing stations and 31 evangelists who came to join him. The following year, he renamed these missions as the Salvation Army. And by then, he had 81 missions and 127 evangelists. So people were coming to faith in Christ. People were seeing his vision and joining and going along with him. He also began to open food shops he realized you can't preach to people on an empty stomach. I eat not the preacher, but the people listening. So he began to open food shops, and his son, Bramwell Booth, 
every morning. He used to get up at 3 o'clock. And he would walk down to Covent Garden with a wheelbarrow and, and scrounge whatever vegetable they didn't want to sell because it was beginning to rot or past its sort of sell-by date in those days, put it in the wheelbarrow and wheeled it home, calling in at the butchers on the way to get a bag of bones, to boil the bones, to mix with the vegetables, to try and get some basic food into those they were actually going to preach to. It was an absolute nightmare. By doing the kind of work William Booth was doing over these 11 years and, and going on, he was hitting at those who profited from vice and they didn't like it. And so very quickly, William Booth began to raise the ire of, of publicans, the press, wealthy people in London, and even the church. They began to rebel against what this man was doing. And uh, he began to face an awful lot of opposition. So right, just doing a little bit here and there, a little bit here and there. But as these stations opened up, it was becoming quite noticeable. In 1878, someone had the great idea of, of unfurling a flag of blood and fire, and it was in Coventry. So here they were, the Salvation Army. We've now got our banner, blood and fire. Well, an army needs a general, so we're going to call him General William Booth. And then they worked out all the ranks within the denomination. Then they published a magazine called The War Cry and had lots of military expressions like a nail drill and to fire a volley and they had citizens and to fix bayonets, all this kind of military language. Well, you can't have the military without the music. And William Booth realized the organs or uh, <coughs> those kind of squeeze things, you know, the old pedals, he said, they're to, they're to church chapel. And, and hymns, it's too much kind of churchy music. And so they went out, and those kind of organs went out, and in came the band. The first man to be the musician in the Salvation Army was a man called William Fry. William Fry came from Salisbury in Wiltshire, and uh, he, along with his three sons, Ernest and Fred and Bertram, formed the first Salvation Army band. He finished up, by the way, in Glasgow. And I just saw this, and I know you like these kind of things. One day I was in Glasgow. I was walking through the cemetery looking for the grave of Lord Kelvin. Yes, the second law of thermodynamics. And just, just a stone's throw from Lord Kelvin is William Fry, the first bandmaster in the Salvation Army. How, how very interesting. And just a stone's throw away from the man who wrote Wee Willie Winkley runs through the night. You know, okay. <laughs> They got rid of church music and took all the music of the world and began to put Christian words to it. And uh, the tune that really got the expression, why should the devil have all the best music, was Champagne Charlie. They wrote hymns like this. Elijah was a jolly old man and was carried up to heaven in a fiery van. Now, can you imagine people in those days? Can you imagine people in those days? You know, you're sitting in your front room when suddenly down the street come, come people pretending they're an army, waving a flag saying blood and fire, yeah, with this band. And in the early days, they had banjos, they had bin lids. A man called George Scott Railton had made a, a maracas out of bones from the morning stew. <laughs> So you look out of your window, and these people are kind of going down the road, ranting and raving and shouting about Jesus. Folk are going, what on earth is this? Opposition arose against them, and it was united under what was called the skeleton army. People were really angry at what they're doing, and so those who opposed kind of fought under the banner of the skeleton army. And they caused a lot of damage to the Salvation Army. In 1882, that's just four years after being called the Salvation Army, they reported 699 officers were assaulted, 251 of those were women and 23 were children, and in that year, 85 Salvationists were imprisoned for being a public nuisance, 15 were women, 60 of their buildings were totally trashed and were unusable, and they had their first martyr. A young girl called Susanna Beatty was kicked to death in London. Some people in the church loved them. 
Bishop Lightfoot, that great scholar and linguist, he thought they were wonderful. And uh, Frank Crossley of Crossley's Motors, uh, a great benefactor, he gave them a hundred thousand pounds. C. H. Spurgeon, believe it or not, was a great supporter of them. And Lord Northcliffe, the founder of the Daily Mail, he was called the Napoleon of the Press. He always wrote about them in a warm manner in his newspaper. But not everybody. Lord Shaftesbury hated them. And Thomas Huxley used to write against William Booth in the Times on a regular basis. He wrote 12 letters against them, hard-hitting letters of 14,500 words. He used to call William Booth Field Marshal Von Booth. I quote from one letter. He said, William Booth is a brazen-faced charlatan, a pious rogue, a tub-thumper, and a masquerading hypocrite. He is sensual, dishonest, sacrimonious, and a hypocritical scoundrel. You get the drift. (laughs) There's no doubting that the Salvation Army turned the country upside down with this kind of stuff going on right around the country. By 1883, they had 400 buildings in this country that seated half a million people. And William Booth said on a typical Sunday, most of those seats were filled. And by 1885, he reckoned that a quarter of a million people had come to the penitence forum and confessed faith in the Lord Jesus. One of the big issues that the Salvation Army dealt with in those days was child prostitution. It was a massive problem. And we have the Salvation Army to thank after many, many battles of raising the age of consent to the age of 16. Good-minded people had tried to get this passed through Parliament on many occasions, but it was turned down for obvious reasons. And in the end, a man called W.T. Stead and Bramwell Booth, William's son, they devised a plan whereby they would get hold of a girl to show how easy it is to get hold of a girl in London. They proved their point very well, but they seemed to have fallen foul of the law. And when they had made their point, those in the press jumped on them. W.T. Stead was taken to court, and he was sent to prison for three months. Bramwell Booth got away lightly, but it certainly left a lot of mud on the Salvation Army's uniform. By the way, when the Titanic went down, W.T. Stead was on it, and sadly he drowned. And a couple of years ago, Ian Hislop, Remember, he did a program called Victorian Do-Gooders. And one of those do-gooders was W.T. Stead. And if you go into Darlington, and if you're in that part of the world, you will find a pub that is named after him, uh, and that's where he came from. Another thing that uh, William Booth was, was, was very conscious about was that there were many, many hungry people in London. And so he was desperate to open... Places where cheap food could be bought, wholesome food, warm food, to get it into people's stomachs. But he realized after a while this was totally impractical. He meant well, but it was a huge financial drain on the Salvation Army. To show you how kind of hardworking he was, in those early days they used to rent halls. And some of these halls were dance halls and things that kind of were used for that kind of thing that didn't sort of empty till about 2 o'clock in the morning. And so at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock on a Sunday morning, he had his people up scrubbing the floors, getting rid of any odors or anything that shouldn't be there, washing the chairs and putting them out for, for the meeting the following day. He was pretty hard working. In the east end of London at that time, there were around 500 charitable societies trying to do good to people who had very little in life. Booth acknowledged they don't need sermons. They don't understand them. What these people need is straight talking about Jesus. So he never preached to them. He taught them about Jesus. He said, if I had picked 30 men at random out of the congregation, only one would have a collar. 
The rest just had scarves around their neck, which was a sign of being just kind of very, very poor people, just, just a low-down bloke with a scarf around your neck to try and keep yourself warm. He said, what do I do with these people who get converted? If I send them to the church, the church doesn't want them, and secondly, they don't want to go anyway. They want to stay with me. And so you can see how the numbers grew, even though he did not intend to start a denomination. He said he never fished in other people's waters. These early people were not educated people. Let's get that clear. They were not educated people, but they were full of wit. And it must have been a very interesting place to be when, when these people came together. Some of the men who, who worked with them as they started to kind of get the undercarriage down and see the lights of the runway coming up. Some of the men who worked with him, one man was called George Scott Railton. He was the cleverest man in the Salvation Army. He'd gone to the mission field in Morocco and had failed. He had he'd tried to do something at home and, and got himself in debt. And he heard what William Booth was doing and went to join him and live with him. Booth was very open-minded at first. I'm not so sure I can work with this man. But in the end, they stayed together for 48 years. He wrote a most interesting inside account of the life of, of William Booth, which, which I find very interesting. So there's George Scott Railton. His son, David Railton, became a Church of England vicar. And he was the main motivator behind pressing for a tomb in Westminster Abbey true for the unknown soldier. So, so that tomb came out of the heart of the son of, of a Salvation Army officer. Another big man that William Booth worked with was a man called Elijah Cadman. He was illiterate. He couldn't read, but he always preached with a Bible in his hand. And Railton said it was often upside down as well, but the people, <laughs> the people he was preaching to were no wiser about it. How was Cadman converted? He went to watch a public hanging at Warwick Jail. And after the hanging was over, somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, the way you're living, you'll be next. He said, it sobered me up. And I began to speak, seek, about, seek after spiritual things. The Salvation Army, as I say, grew and grew and grew and, and started to have a massive impact worldwide in, in places like Australia. It even went to Germany, it went to, to Switzerland, uh, it even went to Japan. And uh, we'll have more about to say, more to say about that tomorrow. William Booth then wrote a book, his magnum opus. He wrote in darkest England. It's a treaty of 149,000 words. He said, there's great poverty in London. It's not going to go away. How can we address it? We've got to change the structure. Other people had done the same. There was another social reformer called Charles Booth, no relative, and also a man called Henry Mayhew, who had done similar things. You can imagine the press laughed at William Booth. This is so childish. This is so naive. But I have to say, you've got to give it to him. He wanted to do something for these people. You know, how can we get people, he said, out of the poverty trap and out of the unemployment trap? How can we get people out of prostitution and get them into good employment? He tried hard. At the end of, of all the publishing, about a million copies of that book were sold, and it went worldwide. He started what was called the Hadley Farm Colony. The idea was you get men from London who were unemployed, you send them out to Essex, you put them on the farm, you teach them a job, and then you send them on to get a trade. He tried to do something. Again, he was laughed at for that kind of thing. During his time, in the 1880s, 9,000 people went missing in London every year. And who cared? So he opened a missing persons bureau. Also, a big employer in London was, was the matchmakers, making matches. Sulphur, you know what happened? Fossy jaw. And, uh, you know, it would, it would eat away your face, and it was a very, very painful death. So what did William Booth do? He was part of a project to introduce safety matches. And every time you strike a safety match, think of William Booth. When you think of the age of consent, think of William Booth. 
You can imagine the big matchmakers were up in arms. This is terrible. He's robbing us of our trade. But within 10 years, the nation bought in to the idea. When the army was in full swing, William Booth reckoned they were reaching 50,000 people a week through their meetings. On top of that, he said, we were visiting 54,000 homes on a weekly basis and publishing 27 weekly newspapers that had a readership of 330,000 people. Now, there's a lot more I can say about William Booth, but I've spoken for 58 minutes, and that's long enough. Let me say this. On the 24th of June, in 1904, King Edward VII invited him to Buckingham Palace. And so William Booth went to meet the king. And before he left Buckingham Palace, the king asked him to sign the visitor's book as one does. This is what William Booth wrote in the visitor's book. Your Majesty, some men's ambition is art, some men's ambition is fame, some men's ambition is gold, my ambition is the souls of men. Physically speaking, William Booth was six feet, one inches tall. But in relation to what I've just told you, At that level, he was a spiritual giant. Well, that's the good. Tomorrow is the bad and the ugly.